and got this uh, bird-friendly tree activity started. Uh, our speaker tonight probably needs no introduction. She was one of our founding members over three decades ago. Uh, I have uh, spent time with her in the Boundary Waters. Uh, we go to plays together. Uh, she's one of probably a half a dozen really expert, expert birders in this community. But that's not what she's here for tonight. She's here to share us uh, with us her experiences of visiting the Galapagos Islands. Please help me welcome Nancy Stevens. Thank you very much. Uh, before I start the pictures, I'm going to give you a little bit of background information, kind of a historical um, guideline. Uh, the islands, Galapagos Islands are located in the Pacific Ocean about 650 miles off the coast of Ecuador. Um, and I went there with a small group in January last year. Uh, the islands were first discovered back in 1535 and nothing much happened until they were rediscovered by pirates and buccaneers and used as a hideout um, for raiding the um, cities in, and towns along the coast of Peru and Ecuador. Oh, you can't hear me? Okay. So, so if you just slip this, slip this here, and hopefully the battery will help okay. you. Okay. <laughs> I'll try to be in it myself. <laughs> um, in the late 1700s, Spain sent uh, a visit, a uh, scientific visit to the islands, and uh, all records of that visit were lost. It's off again. It's off, isn't it? It's off. Mm -hmm. The islands were devastated by the people that came there early and also by the people that came there later on. Uh, the whaling industry started in the late 1700s and for uh, about 100 years they just devastated the whales to get whale oil to light the lamps of the world. At the same time, the sealers came and they almost exterminated all the fur seals. Um, they also discovered that tortoises could endure a long time in the, um, <coughs> in the bottoms of their ships tipped upside down. They didn't require food or water for a long, long time. So here was a ready food supply, and it's absolutely unbearable to think of such cruel, cruel treatment. So the tortoise population was nearly wiped out as well. Uh, the United States, uh, in 1813, sent a uh, ship down to destroy the British whaling fleet, and while they were there, they managed to let go some goats on one of the islands, uh, Santiago Island to be specific. Um, the population of goats on Santiago Island right now is over 80,000. <laughs> and you can imagine what they are doing to the vegetation out competing the tortoises for food. Um, the goats strip the barks off the trees and uh, then the trees die and that eliminates shade and so forth. Um, Ecuador uh, decided that it had a pretty good thing going and it better would take care of these islands. So in 1832, they annexed the Galapagos. Nothing much happened for a while. Um, they decided they would try to colonize it. They sent some few settlers over and they had a penal colony there two or three times and they all kind of fizzled out. In 1835 was when um, Darwin came on the HMS Beagle and spent some time there observing the flora and the fauna of the islands and afterwards from his experience was able to formulate his theory of evolution. Um, I'm lost again. Huh? Can you hear? 
Okay, I'll just yell. <laughs> you try. Okay, yeah. Just get, wave at me if you can't hear, and I'll try to talk a little louder. We arranged this, but the power button had been left on, so we're, we're a little bit. But if she really needs it, okay, she can use it. Um, after World War II, there were still some settlements, a uh, few small settlements on the four largest islands in the archipelago. Um, in 1934, the very first legislation was passed to protect the islands, but it wasn't very effective until about 1959 when they passed more legislation and Ecuador declared that all the area without any human population was therefore a national park, which was very lucky because that, in fact, meant 97% of the entire archipelago uh, did not have any human population on it, so it was a national park. And who are we saying? Who is here? I know you didn't want to. How's that? Is that better? That's <laughs> great. Oh, better. Um, in 1960, the Charles Darwin Research Center was formed. In 1968, the Galapagos Natural National Park Service was formed. So they uh, have been very slow to catch up in fighting the problems that they faced. Um, the major problems, I think, right now are the feral animals and the invasive plants that have come in. They have feral dogs, cats, pigs, burros, goats, cattle, and rats. And that's not that's not the half of it because the plants are just as bad. And the worst offenders for uh, non-native plants are the guava, climbing tree, lantana shrub, and elephant grass. Um, they outcompete the native species, and the feral animals outcompete um, the native mammals and all the other uh, fauna for food and shelter. Uh, the pigs have been known to uh, gobble up the sea turtle eggs as they are being laid. So, so these are some of the problems. But there are some wonderful things going on too. Tourism is what is going to save the Galapagos, and it has been. Um, tourism didn't begin in earnest until the middle of the 1980s, and it has really taken off. And the people in the Galapagos and the country of Ecuador need our tourism dollars to pay for the research that need, they need to do and the maintenance of the islands and um, watching out for the um, protecting what they have there, restoring the animals. They need to, um, they need to have a much larger group of people to help them um, maintain what's going on there. So, now let's look at some slides. Okay. Yes, and let's turn the lights down. Island, 
And there, okay, at, at the airport we were met by our guides and taken to the harbor and then we went out onto a yacht which was to be our home for the next eight days. So, <clears throat> this is where we landed, San Cristobal Island. I'm going to show you where we went. From there, uh, up in here, and then overnight we went all the way up to Genovese Island. That's a long, long way to go. We sailed all night long. And then the next day we sailed again and came all the way over here to the um, western side of the largest island, which looks remarkably like a seahorse. Uh, we visited Fernandina, and then we went back over this way and went to the west end of Santiago Island. We did not see any feral goats, thank goodness. Uh, and then we visited the west end of the island, Bartholomew, Bar Bartholomew Island. From there, we went to um, Santa Cruz and disembarked. We took a bus and went up into the highlands, and we spent the night at a private farm in the highlands and explored this area. Uh, then we went to Puerto Ayoro, where the um, Charles Darwin Research Station is. From there, um, overnight, we sailed all the way down to Española Island, spent some time there, and then we went back here for our return trip. So we covered an awful lot of territory. Um, these are all volcanic islands, and the oldest ones are on the west hand end. The islands are, they think, have been formed over what they call a hot spot. It's more or less a stationary um, place where there is magma, magma underneath that keeps pushing on the crust. Occasionally it breaks through and forms a volcano. Uh, the crust um, is slowly moving to the southeast. So a volcano will form and the plate is moving, and then pretty soon there's another hot spot uh, that um, erupts, and there's another volcano, and then over a considerable amount of time, um, the hot spot itself is stationary, but this is all moving from the northwest to the southeast. So the oldest islands are here, and the youngest ones are, are up here. Next. Uh, our arrival on San Cristobal, and we stood in the hot sun waiting to go into the visitor center and through customs, and what saved us was these two huge Opuntia cactus plants that were filled with some kind of Darwin finches, and we had nobody to help us identify them at that point. Next. We were taken to the harbor, and next slide. One of these two is the levee. The group that we went with is called Natural Habitat Adventures, and I have been with them before, um, twice before. I found them an excellent group to work with, and they took very, very good care of us. Um, and once we got on board and got settled, they, they just treated us like royalty. Next. Um, after we'd gotten settled in and had a bite to eat, we sailed up the coast. <coughs> Uh, to a small lagoon and went ashore. Uh, we did some swimming and some snorkeling and we walked around. Next. And the first thing we saw on shore were some sleeping sea lions under a poison apple tree. Next. I never got enough of the sea lions. They were just so wonderful to watch. Uh, next. And here on the sandy beach there were lots and lots of tracks, but this is the track of a uh, marine iguana that had just gone. We didn't happen to see one there, but we saw its track next. Um, there was a small tidal pool um, at one end of the beach, and there was a lava gull, very, very dark bird. And we discovered that there are only 400 nesting pairs of this gull in the entire world. So this is probably the world's <laughs> rarest gull. Very, very dark. You can see why it just blends in so well with the lava rocks in the surrounding area. Next. One of the seals uh, decided to take a swim, so we got that picture. Next. 
um, we journeyed off the coast again, uh, further out, to a place called Anchor <coughs> Rock, and we were to see nesting seabirds. There were colonies on the rocks, but by the time we got out there, it was getting rather dark. We could hear the clamor of the frigate birds and blue-footed boobies, but we didn't get a good look at them until another day. Next. But we did get one beautiful sunset. <laughs> Next. So, after, after that, this is when we went all the way up to Genovese Island. And if you can see, it's, it's roughly uh, almost all a circle. This is all that's left of uh, Caldera, um, the cone <coughs> of a volcano. Everything is eroded away on this end, and this was the center. This is where the caldera was. And this is called Darwin Bay, and we went into Darwin Bay, anchored there, and then explored the southwestern, southeastern tip of the island. And in the afternoon, we went into the beach. Okay, next. are Nazca boobies. They originally were called uh, mast boobies, but they uh, think that these are now a separate species. And they were so close to us. Um, I, I, I don't have a very good camera, but um, we were able to get very close to a lot of these creatures, and they don't have any fear of humans for the most part. So um, I was probably about six feet away maybe seven feet away. And this is a courting pair. Next. Um, this one is bringing pebbles in to form a circle to define its territory where it will have its nest. Next. And here they are uh, billing and carrying on. While we were there, next, um, we saw a small Darwin's finch. This is nicknamed the um, vampire finch. They, uh, some of the finches groom other creatures, and this habit apparently started uh, grooming, and unfortunately now it has reached the point where they peck down to the base of the feathers and draw blood and drink the blood. So they're called vampire finches. The boobies do not seem to mind. Next. <laughs> Um, also, at this uh, tip of the island, we found some great frigate birds. They were still nesting, a few of them. Uh, this is a female. There are, the males are all black. Uh, the female shows white on the breast and rust on the throat. And this is a juvenile over here with a whitish head and a white patch along the edge of the wing, the, the surface of the wing. Next. The um, young frigate birds are able to fly when they're five or six months old, but they remain dependent on their parents for about a year. So the, this one is sitting on a guano nest waiting to be fed, although he could probably very well feed himself. Um, because the young are dependent for such a long period of time, the frigate birds only nest every other year. Next. Also in the same vicinity were red-footed boobies, and I found them just so beautiful to look at. It's, it's not a carmine red, it's kind of a rosy red that they have, and bright blue bills with a hint of this pink up here. And their plumage is so soft and brown, it looks like velvet. Next. They are the only boobies who have prehensile feet. They can. Uh, sit in trees and they nest in trees. They nest in shrubs like this that are quite open uh, at this time of year, but they nest down low to protect themselves from predators. Next. And this one is uh, looking for a mate, so he's doing this, what they call sky pointing. Uh, you'll notice there's not much color in the landscape except for a few yellow blossoms, and I have a picture of one of those. Uh, this is a plant that it was just coming into bloom called Cordia lutea, yellow cordia, the uh, naturalists call it. Next. It has very, very sticky juice. Um, and I'm 
not sure if I can remember all the creatures that eat these blossoms. Next. Um, we continued on to another part of this lava plateau, and the walking was very difficult, so I was either watching where I put my feet or looking through my binoculars, so I didn't take as many pictures there, but we were fortunate to see short-eared owls. Now, this is the Galapagos owl. They look ex just about like the short-eared owls that we have here in Wisconsin, but it is um, endemic to the Galapagos. There were a pair of them hunting, and uh, they were very well camouflaged. It took quite a few moments for most of us to be able to find them with the binoculars. Next. Also in the area were red-billed tropic birds, and I, I borrowed this picture too. They were flying around very, very noisy, and the frigate birds were chasing them, and uh, trying, as these birds were were bringing food back, uh, the frigate birds were chasing them. That's what frigate birds like to do. They are pirates of the air. Next. In the afternoon, we went into the uh, beach in Darwin Cove, and this gives you a much better idea of what the terrain is like. It's all eroded black lava, and on the top is, it's this, by the way, is the end of the dry season, so there were there were hardly any leaves on, on some of these deciduous shrubs. Up on the top, uh, there was an Opuntia uh, prickly pear cactus forest. Also mixed in were some mangroves, and mangroves had some green leaves. We went into the beach. We were going to take a walk. There was a trail there. But unfortunately, there was another group ahead of us, and we kind of delayed starting. We didn't want to be right on their toes, on their heels. The sun was beating down, there was no shade, and I decided that I was going to stay on the beach and find the shelter of a rock and not go on a long, hot walk. So two of us stayed behind with uh, one of our guides next. And lo and behold, there was a, a juvenile um, frigate bird on the beach and exercising his wings. The young often have this orangey wash on the throat sometimes on the top of the head. He was very obvious, and he wasn't paying any attention to us at all, so we took several pictures. Next. Very photogenic. By the way, um, if a creature approaches you, that's okay. But you may not approach a creature, any of the um, creatures, within six feet. And you may take pictures of them, but you may never use a flash. Okay, next. This gives you an idea of the tremendous bill, very formidable uh, hunting equipment. Uh, they feed by skimming the surface of the water and grabbing food, or by pirating, uh, bothering other birds. I read just recently <laughs> that uh, these are they are so tyrannical that sometimes when the boobies catch something and go to land, the frigate birds will come and land beside them, pick them up by the tail, and shake them and make them disgorge their food. <laughs> so, look at this, this uh, line, on, a distinctive line on the back of the, of the wings. That's an incredible bird. Next. And overhead, they look uh, very prehistoric. It looks like they are tethered by some kind of invisible lines, like great kites. And the frigate birds were, wherever we were, where there were frigate birds, they were always in the air. Next. Um, Opuntia, prickly pear cactus. There are many, many different species of Opuntia. And some are small and uh, like this. This is a fairly small one, but some are also trees. Next. I was looking at some of the things as I walked along the beach. Uh, by the way, we always wore sandals when we went ashore because some of the beach sand was rather coarse. Uh, some of it was sharp. Some of it was made of shells and coral and broken bits of, bits of lava. This wasn't so bad. This, by the way, is a seal skull. Next. Uh, this is a swallowtail gull that came to rest near the Opuntia, 
and I thought this was incredibly beautiful, very beautifully marked with red legs and feet and a bright red ring around the eye. Um, this is the only gull that hunts nocturnally. And at night it flies a long distance from shore to, to forage for food and next to <coughs> And when uh, they return, they have a system, they emit some clicking noises, which is very much like bat echolocation. And this is to help them from crashing into the rocks at night. Beautiful bird. And you can just barely see the swallow tail. Next. Gull tracks in the sand. Next. More composition of the sand. Uh, shells, bits of coral. Lava rocks, um, very beautiful. Next. Also sharing the beach with us were some very relaxed sea lions. Next. Um, our vessels out here, and as you can see, we're not alone. More. Uh, next one. More surf, more rocks, and next. A brown pelican, a juvenile brown pelican came to join us. Next. And he showed off a little bit. Keep going. And finally came and landed very close to us. Next. And showed his magnificent wings. That's a lot of feathers to take care of. <laughs> it was delightful to have him around. And uh, then it was beginning to get warm. Next. So our uh, guide who was on the beach with us called for the panga. This is a motorized dinghy, dinghy, and it is the way that we got from ship to shore. So they came in to pick us up, and by the way, that's a swallowtail gull. You can see his swallowtail just barely. Next. Okay, where am I? Uh, okay. Um, From Genovese Island, we sailed overnight again, all the way over here on the other side of the large island, Isabella, and anchored over here. So when we woke in the morning, we had an entirely different scenery to look at. Next. We did not go ashore on Isabella. One of the reasons is that um, Alceda Volcano, it's made up of six volcanoes. Can you go back? This island is made of six volcanoes. They all flowed together. Um, Wolf is the tallest uh, in the archipelago. It's 5,600 feet. This is the biggest, broadest Alceda volcano. And it has the largest population of giant tortoises on its slope. However, the trails have been closed and people are not allowed to go up there anymore because they are trying to exterminate the feral goats, which are really competing savagely with the tortoise population. So we did not go ashore. However, what we did was uh, go up the shore here and this way up into Banks uh, Bay. This is Boulevard Street. Next. We walked uh, up along the coast to see graffiti that was put there in the 1800s. And it will stay there until nature erodes it all away. Uh, low tide. Keep going. Uh, oh, a brown knotty, which is a turn. Keep going. Uh, this was our first look at a Galapagos penguin. Guano stained rocks. Um, one of our guides, Roberto, and we're looking back into the cove. Up in this area is a brackish lake, uh, Darwin Lake. Everything down here is either Darwin this or Darwin that, uh, or Galapagos this or Galapagos that. Next. Um, so we just kind of cruised along the, the cliffs and to see what we could find. Next. A seal of, I, I just, the surf was so beautiful, I just kept taking more pictures. Next. Uh, we were, again, not alone. Our uh, levy is back in here with a sister ship, and then there's a larger yacht that has just come in. Next. 
More surf, more rocks, it's showing the different ways the lava flowed. It's just endlessly fascinating. Next. Our first marine iguana. Uh, lots of little crabs, uh, ghost crabs, and Sally Lightfoot crabs. I love the name. Next. <laughs> and this was the first encounter with blue-footed boobies. We were not very close. And if you look, you can see the blue feet. They really stand out. Blue. Look at the blue. Look at the blue. Look at the blue. <laughs> More blue. <laughs> so, you know, we really didn't see this. The Galapagos are famous for the blue footed boobies and the antics that they go through in their courtship display, you know, lifting their bright blue feet and carrying on. And we never saw that at all, which was kind of a disappointment. <laughs> But I was just glad to get to see them next. Next. Uh, as we were going along the edge of the cliff, our guide noticed that suddenly the birds were filling the air. There was a feeding frenzy going on out in the bay here. Um, and a, a, a school of tuna were enclosing a small school of feed of fish. And from out of nowhere, from all corners of the sky came frigate birds and blue-footed boobies and red-footed boobies and Nazca boobies and swallowtail gulls and everything else. And we watched them, and pelicans, brown pelicans, and we watched them plunge dive, which is really quite thrilling. As the um, tuna enclosed the small fish, it's a wonderful area for other birds to feed. So. They plunge, uh, folding their wings, and plummet into the midst of the school of fish, just like a bullet. Next. And by the way, the boobies have learned to swallow what they catch before they come to the surface so that they won't be mobbed by the frigate birds. <laughs> so. uh, in the afternoon, we went to Fernandina Island, which is the most pristine in all the archipelago. Next. Uh, it was very stark, quite barren, and this kind of lava is reasonably easy to walk on. They have two kinds of lava, the ropey kind, which is called pahoehoe lava, and the very rough, jagged uh, kind called aa -uh lava, which it's like, uh-uh, oh, oh no, no, we don't want to go there. But this is the Pahoe Hoi lava, which is okay to walk on. And the first things that we encountered were the flightless cormorants. And they were courting. Next. They were splashing around in the water, and um, then they went up onto shore. Next. And they were billing and cooing, and they were making, the males were making the most ridiculous noise grunting, grunting, grunting. And the females, um, for the most part, paid very little attention to them. Next. So she's very patient, and they stood there. I didn't get a picture of their vestigial wings. They do kind of shake them out, but the wings are very much reduced, and they do not use them. They are flightless. Next. And of course, right close by were Sally Lightfoot crab crabs and barnacles. Next. Good picture of a Sally Lightfoot crab. They were just everywhere. Next. Uh, we found a mangrove forest, which we had to go through. I've got a picture of it uh, later on. But uh, we encountered this seedling first. They have seed pods that are very buoyant, and they float in the water until they get waterlogged, and then they sink. And if they find a good place, uh, to take root. This is how a mangrove forest gets started. So there's the beginning, right there. Next. As we were uh, heading out onto the island, we encountered a lava lizard. A lot smaller <coughs> than an iguana. This is probably about 12 inches long, maybe 14. This is a male. The females are more highly colored than the males. Next. And then, by golly, we came to a great concentration of marine iguanas. They were uh, just beginning to pile up on each other for warmth, 
This was late in the day, and they, they pile on top of each other to keep warm for the night. Next. Um, I took this slide off the internet because I wanted to show you, and it took me a while to find it. There's a bird right here. This is one of the Darwin's finches. And right now, I don't think I can remember which one. Small brown finch, thank you. <laughs> and, and what it is doing is it's going to groom the iguanas. They have a very fine relationship. A flock of them will, will fly in, and the iguanas, when they want to be groomed, will raise themselves up on their legs so that the birds have access to the underside of the body and, and the, as well as the upper side. Next. They were all over the place. Um, this almost prehistoric looking. Black lava, ugly marine iguanas, black lava, blue water, white surf. Next. This shows you, I don't think they'll ever win any beauty contests. Tremendous long toes and very long claws. They feed on the surface of rocks underwater, um, on the seaweeds. And so these long toes help them, and their claws, help them to cling to the surface of the rock while they're feeding, and also to clamber over the rough terrain <coughs> when they're on land. Next. Oh, that was mangrove, and this is, this is mangrove that was green here. Next. This shows you, they have a rather blunt nose. Uh, land iguanas um, nose protrudes more than this because they don't have to feed underwater. So this is, a, this is an adaptation for feeding on the surface of rocks underwater. Next. Uh, a male beginning to show color, uh, reddish and greenish. He's coming into his breeding time. Next. More ones. We had to be careful where we stepped because they blended in with the lava rocks so well that all of a sudden they were they were. You had to, oh someone would say, oh don't step there. Next. Next. Also uh, on Fernandina, there was a large colony of sea lions. And we watched them for quite a while. Next. They know how to relax. Next. <laughs> they know how to relax very well. Next. <laughs> um, this is a pup nursing. They sometimes will suckle for um, almost two years. And I was told that sometimes you can see a mother sea lion with a newborn pup and nursing a newborn and having the uh, next year, last year's young one, still trying to suckle as well. Next. <laughs> Look at the composition of the beach here. It is mostly lava and shells and coral. And uh, we, you know, as I said, we have to wear sandals because it was very sharp underfoot. Um, there was a young pup, and I dropped down on my knees to take a picture of him, and I dropped my cane. And as soon as I did that, the pup turned and galumphed right over to me and thought this was probably a new toy. He was fascinated with the cane, picked it up in his mouth, and ran away. <laughs> so I ran after him, and I got it back. <laughs> so, without touching him, I did not touch him. I just took the cane. Next. <laughs> the beach was littered with all kinds of fantastic beautiful shells, all kinds of shapes and colors. And the temptation, of course, is to pick them up and put them in your pocket and bring them home for a souvenir, but that is not permitted. So we began to collect some of the prettiest ones, and we put them all together in this area so that we could take a picture to bring home with us instead. It's a sea urchin. Uh, some Bones. Next. This is a whale skeleton, and I don't know what kind. The most commonly seen whales are sperm whales. While we were there, we went on whale watching twice without success. We never did see a whale, 
all the time we were there, and we never saw dolphins either, which was kind of a disappointment. Um, this whale was found, the skeleton was found elsewhere on the island, and the National Park Service thought that it was worth saving and preserving, so they took it all apart and reconstructed it uh, up out of the reach of the high tide and um, storm tides at a place where most tourists would not see it. Um, it, this was not exactly off limits, but it was not the usual tourist path. So we felt quite lucky next to see this. It's probably no more than 15 to 18 feet long. And I don't know what kind of a whale it is, but it was quite a thing to see. Thank you for doing that. Next. Uh, more surf and the volcano of uh, Isabel Island in the background next. So, <clears throat> overnight again, we <coughs> sailed, and we went all the way over to Santiago Island and um, stopped in here at James Bay. Next. So now we're on the other side of the main island, and we went ashore on Santiago. Wait a minute, yes. I'm going to find my notes. I have to remember. We went to so many islands, I have to remember which ones we were on. So this is Santiago, and we went across in our panga, or a wet landing, walked ashore on a black sand beach. Next. Um, the formation here is Consolidated ash is called tuff, T-U-F-F, -F, and the wave action and the wind uh, erode it. So some places there are fantastic formations. But you can see how black the sand is here. Next. No sooner had we come ashore than we were greeted by a Galapagos flycatcher. Not very big. He landed on our hats, he landed on our shoulders, he landed on our cameras, he landed on this big long lens, and thank goodness he landed on the sand so we could take a picture of him. Um, his coloration is really quite light on the front, but he's got yellow down here on the underbelly. Um, colored similarly to our great crested flycatcher here in Wisconsin, but it's about the size of a peanut. Next. Something good. <laughs> Washed ashore on the tide. Next. <laughs> uh, poison apple tree. Um, I like the way the roots are reaching for the water. But the reason I took this is because there is a water tower in the background. This island had, had a settlement on it. And when the National Park Service was cleaning everything up, uh, the people that had lived here back in the 20s and again in the early 60s were miners. They were mining salt from one of the volcanoes, and the ventures did not work both times. But when the National Park Service was cleaning the island up, removing the homes and removing other signs of human habitation, they decided that they would leave the water tower and they would leave some other evidence of human uh, settlement as industrial archaeology. How's that for you? <laughs> Next. So here indeed are remains of fences that had been around homesteads. Uh, we are up off the coastal zone now in what it, they call the arid zone. Arid so, certainly seems to me mean dry, but it is probably has the most diversity in it of, of most of the zones in the Galapagos. So we were followed an old road for a while. Next. And there were some trees that were green. I don't know the names of all the trees. And uh, here is a tree, Opuntia, backlighted by the sun in the shadow of the volcano. Next. And again. Next. Um, I believe this is a Palo Santo tree. And it is beginning to have some leaves. Next. We also found acacia, which is um, endemic. This is the Galapagos acacia. 
Um, this plant, I believe, is used for food by um, some of the native species, but it is being eradicated by the goats and the cattle and the burrows and the pigs. Next. Insects in all the archipelago are probably quite few in number. And so we've considered ourselves right, uh, rather fortunate to find this handsome Galapagos grasshopper. <laughs> and, next, a female lava lizard. Uh, we saw the male who blended into the lava formation very well um, earlier. And this is the female who is browner and has more color on her throat. Um, next. Again, the little flycatcher, the Galapagos flycatcher, joined us. Um, I can't remember the name of the shrub. I apologize, Bob. <laughs> Keep going. We uh, made our way towards the shoreline uh, where there were tidal pools and grottos, and uh, the, this is a great big round hole in the rocks which is fed by the incoming uh, surf. Comes in underneath, fills up the hole, and immediately drains out, and guess what it's called? Darwin's toilet. <laughs> okay, because of flushes. <laughs> Next. Uh, some of the interesting grottos, and uh, we walked all around here. It was really quite fascinating. Next. And again, more iguanas, and I, I have to say, I sent this to my friend here and asked him if it was a beauty contest. <laughs> <laughs> Next. Uh, here is a very highly colored male. He's in fine breeding fettle right now. And this shows you all the spines and the coloration. Uh, their tails, by the way, are flattened uh, laterally from side to side, so it acts as a rudder when they are swimming. Next. These are, by the way, the only iguanas in the world that feed in the water, that swim. This was our first visit to a fur seal colony, uh, and it's the only place we saw fur seals all the time that we were there. And they like to rest just as much as the sea lions do. Uh, the, I found it very hard to tell them apart, especially when they were wet, because then you couldn't see the fur. This has just a little bit of fur on it. He's quite damp and sleeping, but one of the features is that their ears protrude, and that helps you to tell the difference between a sea lion and a fur seal. Next, uh, this is a fur seal that's sitting on a rock, all wet. Next, there was a young pup who wanted desperately to play, and he kept going from one seal to another, and they all wouldn't play with him at all, so he was, he was kind of lonely. Next. More iguanas, next. Uh, more rock formations in the lava, uh, next. And, oh, this was a sea urchin that had not been all broken apart. We'd found parts of sea urchins on the shell beach, and this one still has its feeding teeth here, and it was quite beautiful, next. Hmm. Lo and behold, an oyster catcher. Looks exactly like the oyster catchers that we have here, but this is uh, a subspecies that is endemic to the Galapagos. Very, very noisy. Next. And what do you know? A wimble. When I go to Door County in the spring, I always look for wimbrels along the uh, rocky shores at Bailey's Harbor, hoping to find wimbrels that are heading north to their breeding grounds. And here is a wimbrel down in the Galapagos. It is a migrant. It's spending the winter here. Next. Mm. Uh, there wasn't very much in bloom at this area, but this is a Galapagos morning glory, vining all over the surface. Next. And then we found uh, a yellow warbler. Yeah. Indescribably beautiful. Not the same yellow warbler that we have in Wisconsin. Look at the red patch on the top of the head. Still has the red streaks on the yellow breast. The back is much darker than the yellow warblers that we have here. We found them almost every place we went, and this bird paid no attention to us at all. It was just foraging for food, little insects and things like that. Next. And he 
just minded its own business and kept going. Next. Uh, when we left Fernandina, we took a, a ride. Uh, we went back to our yacht and we rode uh, around the shoreline to the southwestern, southeastern end of the island. And uh, there were lots of rocky islets out in the bay. And uh, I just, they're all volcanic. Many of them have eroded, so there's hardly much of anything left. But they were very beautiful and mysterious, and I took a picture of this one. Next. What we were doing was going to Bainbridge Island, which is a caldera. Um, this is the edge of the cone, and it comes around this way. It's lower on one side than it is on the other. And in the center, there is a lake. Um, I said there wasn't very much color at this time of year. It was the end of the dry season. But this uh, is carpet weed, a sesuvium. And in the dry season, it is brilliant red. So it added such uh, panache to the landscape. Next. We had to wait our turn to get to a place where we could look into the lake. There was a large cruise ship there first. There were two other yachts ahead of us, so we kind of circled the bay, went round and round, and we looked at all the other rocky islands around there before our turn came. And in order to see over the edge of the rim, we had to go up onto the top deck of our yacht. Uh, the lake is large. I, I'm sorry, I can't tell you how big it is, but even with a spotting scope, we found it difficult to see the birds that were on the far shore. There were 23 Galapagos flamingos. Next. Um, our journey around to the southeastern tip of the island took us past a rock formation called um, Sombrero Chino, a Chinese hat. It is very, very barren. It is very rough and jagged lava and uh, this is off bounds. We do not walk on this. This is ah ah lava, the oh oh no no kind. Next, um, it is being colonized by one of the cactus plants. There are the opuntia cactus, and then there are the candelabra cactus, and then there is the lava cactus. Those three types. And so this candelabra cactus grows out of bare lava. You can see how rough it is. Uh, there's a cinder cone up there with a cleft in it. Um, the green patches, I believe, are salt bush. We continued around the edge of the point next. And in the cove, we discovered all this trash that had been washed in by the tide and the wind. And some of it had gone ashore. We, are, we were not allowed to go ashore here, but our guide said, we've got to pick this stuff up. So he actually did go onto the rocks. It's a good thing he had his sandals on. And we were able to clean up all this debris next and bring it back to the ship for proper disposal. Unfortunately, there was um, a plastic milk case way up high that had been tossed uh, beyond his ability to reach, and there were some other uh, milk jugs and things that we could not reach. So this is a small problem. Uh, most people are very careful uh, to dispose of their trash uh, in a uh, proper way, but um, not everybody does. So we cleaned this up. Next. Uh, we went ashore on a very beautiful sandy beach where we found a mother seal with a two-week-old pup. <laughs> This was the youngest pup that we saw. And while we were there, next, we took a short walk and found a Galapagos hawk. This is the, um, this is the top predator. There aren't very many predators, top predators. Um, he's the diurnal one, and the short-eared owl is the other one. They do not, uh, they both, excuse me, I have to backtrack where the Galapagos hawk occurs, the short-eared owls do not occur. Um, so the short-eared owls hunt diurnally as well. 
But this is a young Galapagos hawk, and we walked within 10 feet of him, and he paid absolutely no attention. Next. There he is again. Beautiful. Next. Okay. Santiago. Oh, all right. We came down here around Santiago, and we're going over here. This is where we went ashore. This is, um, oh no. I'm losing my track. I don't, I'm not quite sure where I am. But we stayed overnight right here uh, because we wanted to see Bartolome Island in the morning. Next. We were awakened way before sunrise. And this is the scene that greeted us. By the time we got there, we could not see um, at the night before. We couldn't see this beautiful scenery. So that's what greeted us in the morning. Next. We got into our pangas and went ashore to Bartolome Island before sunrise, next, to climb the volcano. Um, it is very stark and barren, has not very much plant life on it at all. This is all compacted ash, and it was very difficult going. People used to climb it by themselves, but um, a few years ago, the National Park Service decided that they would build steps all the way to the top. There are 365 steps. Um, the wood is cedar, which is not native to the Galapagos. And as they are trying to eliminate all the native, the non-native plants, they use the cedar to build the steps and the walkway. I thought that was a very good use of it. Next. As we were ascending, we came upon the other rare cactus. This is the what is it? lava cactus. This is the lava cactus that colonizes the lava. It grows right up out of the lava. And we were looking back down this cone at some very interesting plants. Um, Tequilia. It is. It forms mats, uh, sparsely mats. It, it spaces itself very well to hold the soil against erosion. Next. Um, as we were going up, but this was one of the scenes that we looked at. We were getting close to the top, and the sun is coming up. Next. As we were going, though, we came upon a lava tomb. As the lava flows down a little channel, uh, the top of it cools and solidifies before the interior does. And as the flow slows down and uh, the lava inside decreases, then it forms a hollow underneath the cover. Eventually, some of it will break away and there is a tube underneath. In some of the islands, these tubes are enormous. People can walk through them and some of them are more than a mile long. So that's a lava tube. Next. Mm -hmm. This is what we were looking at when we got to the top, and that's why we got up before sunrise. Um, this is our ship. Here is a sister ship, and this big cruise ship was just coming in. Um, next. I asked one of our guides, next. Oh, there he is. Juan Carlos. He was terrific. Next. <laughs> I asked him if there was ever any consideration of limiting the number of tourists. Because there were places where we seemed to be waiting in line or following another group and having to wait a little bit. And he said, no, they have not done that yet, although I guess it's being considered. Um, they don't want so many tourists that it, it decreases the uh, value of the experience. But on the other hand, tourism is what they live on. There isn't much of anything else. And so they have to be careful. It's a, it's a balance, a balancing act, and they are struggling with it. This is the classic uh, picture of the Galapagos scenery. We're at the top. Down here is a famous pinnacle rock. We're looking back at uh, Santiago Island, and in the distance, Isabella with the big volcanoes. Next. 
uh, when we descended, we got back in our pangas and we had a tour along the cliffside. Brown pelicans came to visit us next. Uh, they, they, some of our friends went snorkeling in this area back up once. This is about 250 feet high, but below the surface it goes down another 400 feet. And there was no way I was going to go snorkeling there. <laughs> Next. I'm not a very good water person. Uh, we're just, there are flamingos in the, uh, excuse me, penguins swimming in the water here. And I, it didn't come out, but it shows you how clear the water is uh, along the cliffside. Next. Around the edge of a cove, we found a great blue heron. It looks exactly like great blue herons we have here. But it is not. This is an endemic subspecies, <laughs> meaning that it has been isolated from the mainland long enough to have developed uh, its own characteristics. Next. This is an endemic species. This is the lava heron. Very dark and mysterious looking, blending very well into his lava rock background. Uh, patiently waiting. Next. And another look at a Galapagos penguin. Next. Okay. From here, we left and traveled during the daytime over to Santa Cruz Island. And in this canal here, we came ashore. We left our yacht and boarded a bus, and we went up into the highlands. Next. Um, as we got up into the highlands, we encountered lush forest, um, lots of greenery, beautiful trees, and we were in the zone then called the Scalicia Forest Zone. We stopped um, partway up in the highlands, and there was a parking lot. And there was a path on one side of the road, the path on the other side of the road. So we went through the path on the right-hand side of the road, and many of the trees were festooned with vines and beautiful plants. I do not remember what this is, but the next one I do know. Next. These are the beautiful leaves of the passion flower. Next. And there's the blossom. Next. All the trees. This is a Scalicia tree. This tree is in the daisy family. There are many different types of scalicias, uh, from very low-growing shrubs to very tall trees. And up here, they were all festooned with mosses, lichens, and vines. And uh, we are just talking about this and continuing through. Next. You can see how, how lush and green it is. And then as we got to the end of our path, next it opened up, and here is a giant pit crater. Um, there was a lake in it until 1974, at which time there was a series of earthquakes uh, that lasted for about nine days, and the whole bottom of this caldera fell out and just kept disappearing, and it went down and down and down and down and down. And since that time, there has been some debris and, and the plant life has reestablished itself. It was quite a surprise to be walking along through the forest and come out and hear this great hole in the ground. <laughs> and you began to wonder how sturdy the land was underfoot. <laughs> Next, as we went back to go to the other side of the road, uh, where there was, <laughs> believe it or not, another pit crater. They were called Los Gamelos, the twins. Um, a Galapagos mockingbird came to greet us. And I want you to look at him because he is very light colored underneath and kind of grayish, uh, rather stands right out. And he has a very long, slightly decurved bill. We, he followed us around. Next. And as we were admiring him, we heard a vermilion flycatcher singing. <laughs> And everybody went running to see if they could find it. This is not my photograph. I borrowed this one. Um, I have seen a vermilion flycatcher in Oklahoma. This is, um, this is an endemic to the Galapagos. And there were two males singing and a female. And the most amazing thing happened. The female flew from the roadside 
across in front of us, and one of the males came and flew exactly over her, in tandem, without touching, exactly over her, all the way until she perched again. Next. Um, we left this area and headed up into the tortoise reserve and up to a private camp where we were going to spend the night. Next. And of course, when we got into this private camp, there were giant tortoises all over the place. This is the kind with a great big domed carapace. And there were probably about 14 of them wandering around in the field at this farm. Next. Um, you, just, you just wander around, and there they are. They just wander around. Uh, there were tree houses where we were going to spend the night, as well as tents, uh, tents on the ground. Next. A look at the tortoise. This is a farm, so there was barbed wire fence. On the other side of the fence were cattle and horses. Uh, there were uh, chickens running around loose and roosters crowing, and whimbrels. Flocks of whimbrels flying all over the place and making their lovely sound. But we were more interested in the tortoises. Next. This is one of the tents that we stayed in. Uh, more or less like the safari tents that you use when you're going to, uh, to Africa. Next. A very comfortable interior. Uh, that's, I slept in one of these. Next. Uh, the main lodge was also a giant tent with a wooden support. They had a dining room there, a bar, a lounge area. Um, and since it was only the end of January, they still had the Christmas tree up. <laughs> uh, they treated us like visiting dignitaries. Believe me, the food, the service was outstanding. Next. After um, we had been wandering around for a while, one of the guides came up to me because my friend Judith that I went with, Judith lives in Appleton, uh, she and I were the only two birders in the group. And so Roberto said, Nancy, I want to show you something. So he came and took me by the hand, and we walked out into the field, past a couple of giant tortoises, and then there was this place where there was a hole in the ground and steps that went down into a grotto. By the way, look at these. These are what we have as houseplants, impatiens. Mm -hmm. They are not, uh, not native. People brought them in and planted them for decoration, and they have spread wild. But they were very lovely. So we came down the steps, and these are not man-made steps. These are naturally formed steps in the lava rock, and we entered a lava tube. Next. <coughs> and this is what we came in to see. Uh, Osparno, and this is the Galapagos Barno. It looks like the ones that we have in the United States. Um, it was very dark in, in there. This is not my picture. We could not take any pictures down there with a flash. We were not allowed to. So our guide had a red light on his hat, and he turned on his red light, and we could see the bird, and it hissed at us. <laughs> and it flew into another corner. Next. And so this was the other, this lava tube was open at both ends. And so this is what it looked like uh, on the other side. It was really a very magical place. I'll never forget it. Next. Again, up, uh, wandering around in the meadow, uh, tourist and tortoise. Next. <laughs> Absolutely beautiful. While I was watching one of these tortoises and trying to take a picture, um, I became acquainted with another introduced species. Um, I was wearing sandals, and I began to feel a little uncomfortable on my, my right leg and my toes. I said, what's going on? I felt like I just walked through stinging metal. Mm -hmm. And I was standing on a fire ant colony. Ooh. These are not the fire ants that they had in, in South America. This is the little fire ant and they give a much more modest bite, but it was enough to attract my attention. <laughs> so, no lasting effects. Next. When we left the campground, this, this private camp area, we took our bus and we went up to another, uh, an ecological reserve called Cerro Mesa. 
and it afforded us a look at the Scalicia forest that abounds on this island, and a view of the bay way out off to the right, and a wetland area down close to the shore, and these are all cones of old volcanoes. Next. Um, this is a reserve, and the national park land is most of this area. This, however, is not in the national park, and as you can see, all the trees have been removed. There is going to be a giant resort built here, which I think is a darn shame because the view is so spectacular, and um, unfortunately, I guess there wasn't anything much they could do about it. So uh, there's a road now, and all the trees are gone. So that's a problem. Next. We also visited in this reserve the, one of the deepest uh, pit craters on, in the archipelago. And this one still has a little bit of water in the bottom. But I'm guessing, I don't know for sure, but I'm guessing that this is probably about 300 feet deep. Next. Lots of Opuntia cactus growing here, Scalicia trees, different kinds of shrubs, and dead trees festooned with moss and lichens. Next. Our next stop was at another kind of farm. We went to a coffee farm where a most industrious couple is trying to practice sustainable farming. Uh, the wife is a native of the Galapagos. The husband came from Iowa. And they bought a large plot of land with the idea of restoring it to its native state. Um, they began clearing the land, and it's taken them quite a long time to do it. They are now raising bananas, and this is a blossom of the banana. Next. But as they were clearing the land of the non-native trees, they discovered coffee. There were probably about uh, 150 coffee plants. And so they have rescued them and cleared the land around them, and they are now raising coffee and uh, underneath the Scalicia trees, next, uh, coffee <coughs> berries and coffee blossom, next. Scalicia trees, so they are being grown in open shade, which is the way coffee should be grown. Here's another shrub with berries, uh, some not quite ripe. Uh, they do all the work by hand. They have uh, two houses. The second house is um, people that work for them, next. Uh, this is the wife, and she is showing us coffee beans. They harvest them all by hand. They dry them, they ferment the berries, and uh, then they dry them, and then they roast them in five-pound batches. They sell the coffee to the tourists and to one restaurant in the area, but you cannot buy this anywhere else. Next. Uh, these are fresh beans that have been fermented, and then uh, they're going to be dried. And after they're dried, then they're roasted. Next. Banana tree with fruit and blossom. Next. There was a, a small flock of Darwin finches. These, I believe, are small ground finches. And we had some free time after we toured the coffee farm. And some people were just wandering around. I went and sat on the lawn because I wanted to get close to these. And so I just sat down and waited for them to come to me. Next. So they're very nondescript. Almost all the males are black. Some of them have a little white here and there. The females are all brownish and very nondescript, too. Um, and their differences, I'm not going to tell you all about that because it takes too darn long. Um, <laughs> I think we saw five species, I'm not positive. Even our naturalist guides had trouble identifying them. And, but I was just so glad that I got to see them. So this is a small brown fish, next. We had dinner at a very beautiful restaurant, museum, art shop. Uh, relics all over the walls and handmade pottery inside, next. Artwork for sale, next. Uh, giant tortoise shell that was 
collected long before it became illegal to do that. Uh, the food was absolutely superb, and the grounds were beautiful. Next. Um, this is a coconut palm. It is, they think, it could have floated. It could have floated to the island and become established that way, but they think really that it was probably brought in by tourists. However, the coconut palm is everywhere. It's in the cities, um, along the coastline, and they're very beautiful trees. Next. And this, believe it or not, is philodendron houseplant <laughs> growing 30 feet up the tree trunk. This is Zappa. <laughs> he was, uh, he worked for Natural Habitat Adventures, but he was a guide in Brazil. So he came along with us as a guest. He was an outstanding photographer, and he was photographing the birds of Ecuador. He had already photographed more than 700, and was, one is, was on his way to 900 plus. Next. He was dumb enough to be a clown, and he was a lot of fun. Uh, not a very good picture, it's out of focus, but I was fascinated with this plant. This is called a walking iris. And the blossom stalk emerges from one of the leaf stalks. And when it goes to seed, the seed pod becomes very heavy and it tips over and hits the ground. Thereby, and it, takes, uh, it germinates and takes root and creates another plant, therefore walking iris. Yes, next. Um, we came across the top of the island and down the other side to Puerto Ayora, where the Darwin Research Station is located, and that was where we were going for the afternoon. Next. The only shade around was provided uh, when we left our bus under this magnificent tree. It's called flamboyant. <laughs> And they are planted all over the towns and villages. They're just spectacular. And so the temperature on that day reached 92, and there was very, very little shade. Next. This is the entrance to the Darwin Research Station. And it was almost a half a mile to walk in. There was no transportation to get in there. And the heat was, was really very difficult. However, I would not have missed it for anything, because next. we were able to see the young tortoises being captive reared. Um, this captive rearing program began, oh, for goodness sake, I've lost my notes now. I don't remember what year, but it's been going on for several years. The National Park Service and the Darwin Research Station work collaboratively <coughs> together. Um, and they take eggs from the wild, bring them in, and hatch them, and raise the young. They keep them long enough uh, so that they are strong enough to be replaced in their natural habitat. Um, well, they will not be. They have to be big enough so that they won't be uh, preyed upon. So when they are strong enough and big enough to be on their own, then they're taken back to their natural habitat. And when we were there, I think the count was 5,000, at least 5,000 young ones that had been successfully reestablished in their natural habitat. So this is a very important and very valuable program. Next. Cute little guy. Next. Notice they have the domed carapace again. There are oh, 13 subspecies of giant tortoise. And they are all different based on the shape of the carapace. So are, these are the domed ones, but we are about to see something else. Next. Somewhere in this great place is Lonesome George, the last of um, the giant tortoises from one particular island. Let me find, I've got to find my notes. was found, and he's been in captivity for a long time, um, they brought two females, they could not find any females on the island where he was, he was the only one left, hence Lonesome George. 
So they brought two females from the wolf volcano, and he had those two females with him for many, many years. Um, they did lay eggs, but all the eggs were sterile. A week before we came here, they had removed those two females and replaced them with two other females from Espaniola Island, which is one of the oldest, hoping that perhaps they were more genetically close to Lonesome George than the other two females from Wolf had been. So we did not get to see Lonesome George. We thought maybe he was moving in the, in the foliage. Next. However, we did see Super Diego. <laughs> and he is um, a saddleback tortoise. Notice the way the carapace is made. Uh, it has a great mound at the top of it. They have extremely long necks and longer legs than the domed uh, carapace tortoises so that they can feed up higher, they can reach higher. Next. He is very successful. Um, he has females to breed with and they're doing very well. We did not, uh, we did not see them mating, uh, but he was on his way to a female right then. Next. <laughs> and here is a female who was feeding. Look at the length of the neck and this great saddleback shell. Next. And again. Next. Uh, when we left this area, we went back to our ship. We went down through the harbor and were taken back to our ship. The harbor was absolutely filled with vessels. It was quite impressive. Next. But before we got to our vessel, there was this magnificent catamaran. And at the time, we did not know much about it. But it was on its main voyage around the world. It came from Sweden. The top of it is all solar panels. There is a wing that comes out on this side and another on the other side with more solar panels. <laughs> the, this catamaran operates entirely on solar power. And it, was, it had just come through the Panama Canal. And it was not planning to stop at the Galapagos, but we were fortunate enough to see it because they decided they would stay there for a brief time. When I returned home, there was an article about this catamaran in the National Geographic. So I felt very fortunate to have seen this. Quite, quite an amazing thing. Next. Um, this was the beginning of the rainy season. We had a few sprinkles, um, but not much. And I liked this opening in the clouds, and I loved this <coughs> three-masted three yacht over here and a very fancy mansion up on the hill. Next. Uh, now where are we? So we left. Let's take a break for a minute. Want to stretch? Sure. Yeah, let's stretch, because i got to find my notes. <laughs> I've lost, um, lost track of where I am here. I showed you earlier. I, and I'm bringing him back because I wanted to compare him with the mockingbirds that we see on this island. Next. Look how much browner, darker this one is. This is called the hood mockingbird. And it has a much longer decurved bill, much darker coloration. I found these to be very, very fascinating. Before, species of mockingbirds. Uh, but this one, these are, I think, the most interesting. They uh, dig in the sand, they scavenge, they feed on, next, they feed on uh, baby turtles, they feed on baby birds. Um, they've established a different kind of lifestyle. Next. Very, very long decurved bill. Our uh, guide was telling us that they have established a kind of a hierarchy. The, um, they stay in family groups for an extended period of time. Uh, the dominant male and female, very much like a wolf pack, 
Uh, they keep the young of the year with them, and then they have they nest again. And the they do not fly; they run across the sand from place to place. They have become very aggressive. Next, I, I would like to see in another uh, 100, 200, 300 years if they lose the ability to fly completely because they run. There was also an enormous uh, colony of sea lions there. Next. And there were sandy sea lions, there were wet sea lions, there were dry sea lions. <laughs> Keep going. Next. Uh, pup suckling. Next. They know how to relax. Next. I took many pictures of resting, relaxing seals. If you think cats can rest, oh, no. Seals have it all over cats. Next. 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 <laughs> also on this island, there were uh, more marine iguanas, and they were even more highly colored than the ones we had seen earlier. Uh, this handsome male, red and green. Next. Beautiful. If you could call it beautiful. Next. Um, this was kind of difficult walking, and uh, along the rocks we found a Galapagos dove, a very beautiful little bird, and came right close, uh, walked over somebody's boots, uh, bright pink feet, a uh, blue circle around the eye, soft brown plumage, just, just incredibly beautiful. Next. And a small uh, Darwin's finch, I don't know what kind this is, but they were all over. This is a male, very, very dark. Um, we did see a couple of nests. And all the Darwin's finches make the same kind of nest. It's a globular nest <coughs> with an opening in the side. And the only difference is it depends on the size of the bird. But they all build the same type of nest. Next. Um, on this island, there were also Nazca boobies who were nesting. So there were eggs, they were young, they were downy young, and there were juveniles. Next. Uh, swallowtail gull in the background, next. Lots of guano. And finally, blue-footed boobies up close. And here is a young, a still downy young. It looks just so soft and cuddly. Next. More blue-footed boobies against the background of the rocks and the surf. Yes. Next. Uh, this was extremely difficult walking. And this was one place where we had hoped we might see an albatross. As we were coming down here, this entire cliff is covered with nesting boobies and storm petrels. Um, there were thousands and thousands and thousands of them. And Roberto, one of our guides, turned his head and looked that way and he gave out a whoop and he said, Albatross! We had about a one and a half second look at an albatross disappearing around the headland. <laughs> and uh, he said, well, that's probably all you're going to see because the nesting season is basically over. And they've all gone out to sea. So I was disappointed. We kept on walking. Go ahead. Next. Um, as we got up, look at this. This was extremely difficult terrain. Um, even the sturdiest and youngest in our group had difficulty. We almost all of us had walking sticks that day. Uh, up on the lava formations, there was this beautiful display of salt tolerant plants. This red is the carpet weed, um, the green is salt bush, um, another kind of sesuvium, and not in this picture was the blue of seaside heliotrope which is a very bluish in the off-season. Um, so, a spectacular color. Keep going, next. Uh, we rounded a bend, and there was a young Galapagos hawk sitting on a rock, next. Um, we continued on where the surf was coming in. Lots and lots of Nazca boobies, and there was a blowhole, next, which finally <laughs> went off for us, was lovely. The green is salt bush. Next. And then, unexpectedly, we came upon a clearing with young albatross in it. These are not yet ready to fly. They're juvenile birds, and, but they're exercising their magnificent wings. Eight feet 
eight feet of wingspan. Oh, amazing. Um, and then I think there were about seven of them in here. Those were the two closest. We kept on walking on our trail. Next. And right beside the trail. The trails are all marked with these posts. And it was sitting right beside the post. <laughs> you're not supposed to get any closer than this six feet, but if you want to stay on the trail, you better walk right next to this bird. <laughs> this is a juvenile bird, not yet ready to fly, but he has almost all the adult plumage, except for a little patch up under the throat. He made no eye contact. He sat there stoically, waiting for his parents to come back and feed him. The parents may have been gone at sea foraging for up to two weeks. Before. And so this bird just sits here. That's what they do. They sit and they wait. They don't look at you. They don't focus on anything. They just sit there waiting for the parents to return. This is the waved albatross. You can see the wavy look in the feathers up here. It was so beautiful. Look at the size of the feet. You know, they can't just take off from land. They have to patter along the surface. When he's ready to fly, he will patter across the rocks, flapping his wings until he gets to the edge of the cliff. And then, all of a sudden, he will leave the land, and he will launch himself into space, and he will not come to land again for four years. What do you suppose happens if the adults are killed? The young just sit there stoically until they start to die. So, um, the waved albatross, or Galapagos albatross, is probably threatened. I think there are 14 species of albatross in the world, and all of them are threatened or endangered. Um, I don't know if this is threatened, but it certainly needs a lot of protection needs a lot of concern. Next. I want to tell, oh, back up, back up one. Because, you know, I had, I had things that I wanted to see when I went to the Galapagos. Um, and I was glad to see everything. Everything was very, very exciting. But when I saw this albatross, it made such an immense impact on me. I think this bird, was the favorite of everything I saw. All the scenery, all the, all the marine life, everything else. This was the peak of my experience, just to see an albatross, and so close. Next. Uh, we went back to our yacht for our final night, and we watched the sunset up on deck. This was not the end of our trip because we had to go ashore, but this was our final night on the yacht, and we looked, we were all standing up on deck, and it looked like there were two great eyes in the sky looking at us. We talked about it, somebody said, oh, that looks pretty ominous. Next. Um, and I suppose you could think that it was a bad omen, if you were of that mind. Next. But I didn't think so. I, I liked the look of the eyes in the sky, and I guess I want to think that it was a benevolent face, maybe looking towards uh, a brighter future for the audience. And that's where I'm going to leave you. The end.